What's the connection between an operating theatre at St Mary's Hospital in Paddington, London, a volume of this medical encyclopaedia, Al Taslif Laman Ajaz An Al Talif, which roughly translates as an aid to him who lacks the capacity to read big books, and a tonsil guillotine? The connection is a man called Albucasis, otherwise known as the father of surgery and the author of this book. But how can a man who lived in the 10th century have any connection with the sort of pioneering state-of-the-art surgical procedures that go on here? We know very little about the life and background of Abu Qasim al-Zawrawi, or Abu Qasis as he was known to Europeans. We do know, however, that he worked in or near Cordoba in Spain around the year 1000. And we know that he wrote a very large Arabic language medical encyclopedia. The final section of this encyclopedia was a very extensive treatise on surgery. And it's of great importance for two particular reasons. One is it's the earliest illustrated treatise that we have on surgery, for he illustrated it with drawings of over 200 instruments that a surgeon in his day, of course, should be using. And secondly, he included in it a large number of innovations of his own um, in surgical techniques and surgical instruments. Albucasis' innovations found their way to the West via 12th century Latin translations of his treaties and influenced surgical techniques for hundreds of years. Despite technological advances, many are still in use today. There were several circumstances that promoted the achievements that Abacasis and his contemporaries uh, made in, uh, in the field of surgery and, and other aspects of Eastern medicine. The first one, I think, is the role of Islam itself and the fact that in the Quran there are specific statements that um, the, those who are healthy should assist those who are ill, those who are wealthy should assist those who are poor. There is no objection to the blind, no objection to the lame, no objection to the sick. Secondly, and quite importantly, there were um, translations made of Greek medical treatises. These were made in the 9th century in Baghdad, and these treatises, in their Arabic garb, form the foundation for the physician's subsequent work um, in the medieval Islamic world. Uh, they used these, but they built upon them and they added to them, but it, they were a very important foundation for uh, Islamic medical care. So the time was right for Elbukasis and his medical innovations, but what exactly did he do? Well, apart from his treaties, he pioneered many surgical procedures and invented numerous surgical instruments. Evidence suggests that Abacasis was the first surgeon to successfully perform tonsillectomies. From his treatise, we know that he actually devised an instrument that is very similar to what we would today call a tonsil guillotine. He said that first you had to hold the tongue still by using a tongue depressor, and then you would use this instrument, which really consisted of a pair of scissors with transverse blades, formed in a manner so that it, once the tonsils were cut, they would be held for removal from the throat. I can't believe they still use instruments like this in modern hospitals. Well, they do, as I found out by talking to one of St. Mary's consultant surgeons, Mr. Stuart Gould. It's probably quite interesting that uh, you address me as Mr. Gould, because, of course, most doctors are doctor. Uh, and you might be interested in the history of that. And what that is, is that in the Middle Ages, barbers did all the surgery, because all the surgery that was possible was bloodletting, hence barber surgeons and the Guild of Barber Surgeons. And it wasn't really until the late 18th century that you had to be a doctor before you became a surgeon, and that holds true today. So presently we become doctors, then take our surgical exams, and then call ourselves Mr. Uh, as a type of inverted uh, snobbery in many ways. But I am a surgeon and I specialise generally in gastrointestinal surgery. I've been learning about a man called Albuquerque, 
And his contribution to modern surgery was amazing, considering that he lived so many hundreds of years ago. Yeah, and in fact we do use a number of his instruments today in the operating theatre, or at least modifications of, but in principle they work the same way. What, even this tonsil guillotine? That would be a very good example. It is changed in design, but not in principle. And what happens with this is that you feed the tonsil uh, through the hole here. I'll put my finger in, although I won't activate it. And if you get it in the right place, you can then very simply just cut the tonsil off very quickly and without any real bleeding. Uh, it is changed slightly now. This is not commonly used, but there are still some patients uh, where it is the appropriate technique to use. And the instrument has not really changed in all these years. And when I'm ill, it is he who heals me. It's not just the work of Abu Qasis and all those like him who made the Islamic contribution to medicine and surgery so outstanding. In fact, the very concept of hospitals as we know them in the 21st century evolved from an Islamic civilization. The hospital, I think, was one of the greatest achievements of Islamic society. There were, of course, hospitals in the Greek Byzantine world, but there, the structure and function of a hospital changed enormously in the medieval Islamic world. We know, for example, that there were wards for specific purposes. There were wards just for women patients, but then there were wards for those who had fevers, a separate one for those with eye complaints, a separate one for those with gastrointestinal complaints, and a separate one for surgical cases. They would also have had a dispensary, and they would have had a library. And I think it's important for us uh, to remember that clinical bedside teaching in the hospitals was first introduced in the early 10th century in these early Islamic hospitals. It wasn't just the structure and organization of hospitals which allowed them to flourish in this early Islamic civilization. The ethos of treatment for all also played a crucial part. In Islam, there was a, a moral imperative to treat the ill, no matter what their financial status was. In the Byzantine world, a hospital was a, a religious institution, whereas in the medieval Islamic world, it was a secular institution, usually urban, and it was open to all, whether they were rich or poor, male or female, civilian or military, or Muslim or non-Muslim. So the Muslims gave free health care in their teaching hospitals to people of all different backgrounds. That's not unlike St. Mary's. It's a teaching hospital and it's part of the NHS. Allah commands justice and doing good and giving to relatives. And he forbids indecency and doing wrong and tyranny. He warns you so that hopefully you will pay heed.